Hello and welcome to Next in our video series, Insights into RFRS 17, the new insurance standard. I'm Gail Tucker, PwC's Global Accounting Technical Leader for Insurance. I'm a member of the ISB's Transition Resource Group and for many years I've been on EFRAG's Insurance Accounting Working Group. I'm delighted to be joined today by Don Sito. Don's a partner in our Dutch firm where he also is the RFRS 17 leader. Welcome Don. Thank you, happy to be here. So in this session today, we wanted to look at reinsurance. As I speak to various reinsurers and, and insurers around the world, I'm beginning to realise that reinsurance is uh, proving to be a bit of a challenge in RFS 17. So Don, what are some of the issues you're hearing? You're right, Gail. The requirements for reinsurance contracts are complex. The TRG in February and May this year highlighted some of the most pressing issues. One of them was contract boundaries of reinsurance contracts. The other key issues included the accounting mismatch between the reinsurance held and the underlying direct contracts. The explicit requirement to measure the risk adjustment contracts separately from the risk adjustment on the underlying business, the requirement to estimate future cash flows on direct business, as well as issues around the level of aggregation. That's quite a long list, Don. <laughs> so let's start off. Perhaps you can start off with the contract boundary question. Tell us a bit more about that. Happy to. Uh, but before we go into this topic, uh, the these complex issues may have impact on how reinsurers and entities ceding these risks to reinsurers will structure their contracts. And with that, we may see future changes in the legal structures of these contracts. So to go back to your question, Gail. Uh, so let's have a closer look at the contract boundary issue. Certain reinsurance contracts held may have an open-ended termination clause, and reinsurers raise questions whether the contract boundary will be affected by the existence of these open-ended contractual clauses. Let's have a look at an example of a proportional reinsurance contract. Under this contract, all underlying direct contracts that were written during a period, say January 1st to December 31st, for a 12-month cover, are covered by a reinsurance treaty. The reinsurer and the insurance company issuing the underlying contract each has a right to unilaterally terminate the treaty within a 90-day written notice period. Under IFRS 17 paragraph 34 requirements, these cash flows are within the contract boundaries of the reinsurance contract if the insurers compel, can compel the policyholder to pay the premium or where the issuer has substantive obligations to provide a service to the policyholder. And the substantive obligation to provide services ends when the issuer has the practical ability to reassess the risk and set a premium that fully reflects that risk. So in this case, the reinsurance company, the issuer, has the practical ability to reassess the risk by terminating the treaty with the 90-day notice. And consequently, the cash flows that will be within the contract boundary of the reinsurance contract or day one are restricted uh, to those cash flows. Yes, yeah, you're right, Don, and it's quite clear. We discussed yeah. this at the TRG and that equally concluded yeah. that those cash flows outside of that three-month period are outside the contract boundary. I think the contract boundary mm -hmm. point is quite important for insurers mm -hmm. to note because what that might mean is that you're in a different model for the underlying contracts and the reinsurance asset, yeah. for example, PAA versus the general model or even the VFA. So it's certainly mm -hmm. something insurers need to look at, albeit some of the contract boundaries may be able to be changed by terms to mm -hmm. alleviate some of the mismatches. I agree with you, Gail. Another key point is the fact pattern is key to the correct answer. In our case, both the reinsurer as well as the holder, the direct insurance company, have a right to cancel the contract. The answer would be quite different if only the reinsurer had the right to cancel. While the holder doesn't have the right to cancel the contract, such a fact pattern would lead to a conclusion that from the holder's perspective, the contract boundary is the entire contract because the holder has a substantive obligation to pay the premiums for the full term of the contract. So it depends on the contract terms, and as always, we need to read them. You're absolutely right. One of the other issues I know that insurers are seeing as well is risk attaching business. So what we find there is today, most insurers, if they've bought proportional reinsurance cover, they only recognise the reinsurance asset um, when they recognise the underlying contracts as they're written over the year period, and there's a matching there. What you'll find under RFRS 17 as well is unfortunately when the insurer purchases that reinsurance mm. asset on day one, mm. they're going to have to estimate all the expected future cash flows um, that will come from those underlying mm. contracts to recognise the reinsurance uh, accounting on day one. Uh, not something that's very popular, but again, it's something that unfortunately the TRG uh, did confirm as yeah. well. One of the other issues you mentioned was onerous contracts. Tell yeah. me about that. 
Gail, you're right. The owner's contracts is a significant issue. The holder of the direct contract or the group of contracts has to record a loss on day one, while I won't have the ability to offset that loss via the reinsurance contract. In fact, any gain or loss will be reported as CSM, which is unwound to revenue as the services under that reinsurance contract is delivered. Many see this as a fundamental issue, and some believe that this requirement may lead to a change in how reinsurance companies operate. Yeah, you're right. And it's interesting because I think today many insurers mm. think of their contracts net yeah. of reinsurance and IFR 17 is clear that you think of the two separate. One of the other things you mentioned at the beginning, Don, was the uh, risk adjustment. What's the issue there? Yes, this links to the point about owner's contracts. Is today, you mentioned many contracts are issued that take into consideration the net effect of reinsurance. The risk adjustment on these direct contracts is reduced by the effect of risk adjustment on re reinsurance. As a result, the direct underlying groups of contracts are profitable. Under the requirements of under IFRS 17, the risk adjustment for the direct contracts have to be considered on a gross basis, excluding the effects of reinsurance. This could lead to unintended consequences of having groups of owner's contracts at issue, as I mentioned before. Yeah, and I, I think that's right. And it comes back to the point, it feels like there will be less matching yeah. under IFRS 17 than, than we have today in insurance yeah. accounting. So I think that's, that's absolutely right. The board has been clear that they are two separate contracts, the reinsurance and the underlying and the accounting then follows. You mentioned a few other issues at the beginning as well, Don. Take us through some of those. Sure. One of the issues insurers are thinking about in IFRS 17 is the requirement for the unit of account or level of aggregation for IFRS 17 groups of contracts. Insurers are finding that, that some reinsurance contracts cover multiple groups of underlying insurance contracts, and so again, this may lead to less matching between the direct and the underlying contracts than reinsurance have in the current accounting. And one last thought. In some countries, insurers often make an internal reinsurance arrangement between different legal entities, sometimes for solvency capital reasons or in relation to business acquis acquisitions. If the different insurance subsidiaries are accounted under IFRS, they might face some issues I've mentioned, so don't forget about them. Thanks, Don. Well, that's all we've got time for today. Hopefully, that's a long list of issues for, to think about in reinsurance. At PwC, we've just issued a publication that tries to summarise some of these issues as well, and that's available on our website, so I'd encourage you to download that. And thank you for watching.